Welcome everyone and thank you for virtually joining us for the latest version of the Variant Effects Seminar Series. My name is Diego and I'm a member of the VEST Organizing Committee along with Stephen Airwood and Mireya Soma. These seminars are made possible with support and a lot of help from Laura Muffley uh, and Alex Hopkins among several others and our sponsor of the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance. Uh, so a big thank you to them. Also, we are looking to add a few more people to the VEST Organizing Committee, so if helping run a seminar series seems interesting to you, uh, then please follow this link to find extra information about applying. Relatedly, we are always on the lookout for potential speakers for future seminars. If there's anyone you'd like to see present, or if you're interested in sharing some of your own work, uh, then feel free to submit a speaker nomination form. As usual, before starting the presentations, I just have some housekeeping items to mention. Uh, each talk is about 20 to 25 minutes, so there's time for some questions. Today, uh, Daniel is going to speak a little longer uh, since we just have one speaker, but there should still be time for questions. Uh, please post those questions at any time to the Zoom Q&A, uh, and we'll read them out to the speaker at the end. Um, if you have additional questions after the end of the seminar and you're an AVE member, uh, feel free to visit our seminar series Slack channel for more discussion. Uh, and finally, we're posting updates on our Twitter account, so be sure to follow us there at Varying Effects. You can catch the seminar today uh, and previous presentations that have been recorded on our affiliate Ski Map YouTube channel. You don't have to worry about copying this URL. I'm going to post this link um, and the others that I've mentioned um, to the chat once we get started. All the details of this seminar series can be found on our website, including a regularly updated schedule of upcoming speakers. Uh, in our upcoming November seminar, Tyler Starr from the University of Utah will present his work on the evolution of bat coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so be sure to save that on your calendar. For the last housekeeping item, this is rarely an issue, but as a reminder, please be considerate when posting comments or questions. We expect everyone to be respect, respectful and use welcoming and inclusive language. Without further ado, we have a great speaker scheduled for today's presentation. Dr. Daniel Shrevogel is a research staff scientist in the lab of Dr. Lars Steinmetz at EMBL. He develops and applies novel technologies in the functional genomics space by combining high throughput CRISPR-Cas9 genetic screens with complex readouts from single cells. These technologies aim to provide a better understanding of genotype phenotype correlations in health and disease by scaling with the complexity of the human genome. The title of Daniel's talk today is Genome Scale Functional Genomics Screens with Image Enabled Cell Sorting. Uh, and Daniel, free, feel free to start sharing your screen and go ahead and start whenever you are ready. Great. Um, thank you very much, Diego, for the kind introduction. Also, welcome from my side to the today's uh, BESS seminar. I am very much looking forward to introduce you to image-enabled cell sorting technology today. It's um, So our lab is interested in function genomic screening, so I will talk a bit about image-enabled cell sorting, what it is about and what it can do, and maybe what it can, can't do with it. And at the end of the talk, I will also capture a another single cell omics uh, layer, like, like single cell trans transatomics, and tell you a bit about what we are working on in that space in order to combine function genomic screenings um, with single cell transatomic readouts. Image-enabled cell sorting. Um, so what we are basically interested in our lab, it's uh, genotype-phenotype correlation. So we are asking questions such as, what is, what is it actually within our DNA that makes us all different? Or when it comes to different types of diseases, what makes it more or less likely to, do, to develop a specific type of disease? What has been frequently done in the past and what we are current, currently still doing and what was like a really rich source of uh, genetic variation were genome-wide association studies, which really showed like thousands of genetic variants which were associated with different phenotypes or phenotypes of health and disease. And this image from uh, it, it nicely illustrates the complexity of the issue. So we found thousands of variants that, that are somehow associated. They could be also combinatorial effects and so on and so forth. And even more complex, the whole puzzle is getting if you look at where those variants are actually located. 
And indeed, only a very small minority of variants actually encoding regions of the genome, which makes it more or less easy to predict or to characterize their function. However, the vast majority, and that's true across different types of diseases, are actually located within non-coding regions, such as especially enhancer regions. So those variants are thought to indirectly regulate the expression of coding genes. However, for most of the enhancer target gene regulations, for example, we actually don't know which enhancer does contact which target gene, and consequently, we have no idea how these uh, variants are, are working. And one type of experiment that can be done in order to at least partially solve this puzzle is to do high throughput function genomic screenings, which basically only illustrates a very simple experimental principle of perturbing a genetic variant or a genetic locus or a protein coding gene or non-coding gene, for example, with CRISPR-Cas9, and then reading out the effect. So what's happening in the cell if we perturb this specific genetic element? And these function genomic screenings experiments, they come in two different flavors. That they are average perturbation screens where we perform one perturbation per reaction volume, such as a 96 well plate, so we can apply guide RNAs to those uh, plates and read out the effects of those perturbations with all different types of assays. So the readout is very flexible, so there's no limiting cell material. We exactly know in which well has, did we apply which perturbation. However, since we have to generate those perturbations basically well by well, they only have like lower of mid throughput. And that's where pool genetic screens come into play. So here we apply genetic perturbations in a randomized fashion to cells in a population. So we have libraries of perturbations like overexpressing proteins or guide RNAs for CRISPR and so on. So we apply those to cells in population in a way that where one cell receives one perturbation. So we don't know actually anymore which cell received one perturbation. However, since we basically can screen the entire protein coding genome, for example, in a single pipetting step, it has very high throughput. However, since we lose information about which cell received which guide RNA, the readouts are actually limited. However, this limitation has actually been solved recently by combining pool genetic screens with different single cell readouts. Since using single cell technologies, we can not only read out a phenotype within a single cell, but we can also genotype that cell in order to trace back which cell has re received which perturbation. And that's where our lab and also many other labs are heavily working on. So there are several modalities, single cell modalities available for such screening attempts. In the meanwhile, for example, we can, can combine CRISPR perturbations with single cell transatomic readouts and also CRISPR perturbations with single cell phenotyping readouts. And that's actually the two modalities uh, that we want to, uh, that I want to talk about today. So the aim currently of the field is to combine pool genetic screens with single cell methods and also to increase the throughput, the sensitivity, and also the complexity of the readout to get even more information from each, each perturbation to make these assays more and more powerful. When it comes to image-enabled cell sorting, maybe before we go into the technology a bit more closer, let's take a step back and think about how we actually look at cells nowadays. So there are two instrumental technologies that probably everybody of us has used so far which is microscopy and fluorescent activated cell sorting. Using microscopy, we can generate rich readouts of cells of like subcell resolution or cell morphologies, for example. However, if you ever done a microscopy assay, it's, it's sometimes if we see a, a specific cell that we're interested in, it's really hard to isolate that, for example, for downstream assays, such as putting it back into culture and see what happens or downstream omics readouts, for example. So it has very limited isolation capabilities. For example, we can do laser capture microdissection, but these technologies are not trivial and also it's very low throughput. On the other hand, fluorescent activated cell sorting, it's extremely strong when it comes to high throughput cell isolation. So we can isolate thousands of cells per second. However, facts, it's literally blind to any spatial resolution. So what we can detect from each single cell in a flow cytometer it's phenotypes such as the expression level of a specific protein. However, we can't see where this protein is actually localized. And to solve this technological gap, we developed in collaboration with BD Science, Science Bio, Bioscience, our industry collaborator, we introduced image-enabled cell sorting, and I want to go now a bit more into technology and what uh, this actually is about. Before doing so, I, again, I want to mention this is a highly collaborative project, an academia industry collaboration between EMBL scientists, like including Lars Lab, where I'm in Sarah Kuhlin's lab and in the Ample Flow 
flows automatic coausality and the, and the technology itself. It has indeed been developed of, over the last 10 years by extraordinarily talented sciences, uh, scientists at BD Biosciences led by Eric Diebold. Why did the, so let's think about 50 years back when flow cytometry and flow cytometric cells has been invented. So why did it actually take 50 years to establish such technology that can be broadly used across labs? So there are two bottlenecks when it comes to very fast imaging of cells. One problem is to generate blur-free images of very fast flowing cells. So in a flow cytometer, cells are flowing at like one to two meters per second. And consequently, we need specialized imaging technologies that allow blur-free images of, the, of these fast flowing cells, ideally with fluorescence readouts. And the second limitation that's more sorting specific, in case you want to sort cells, we have to analyze those images in real time. So we have to reconstruct those images from raw data in, within microseconds and also analyze those images. And this is enabled by, uh, by, by implementing low latency electronics to reconstruct and analyze Im images on the fly as they are passing through the through machine. There have been several solutions for this um, so far. And I, I'm just mentioning four of the most prominent ones here. One technology that um, probably several of you already know is it's called MNIST image stream. Importantly, that's not a sorter, it's only an analyzer, basically. It combines imaging and it works at around 5,000 cells per second. It's very cool because it has relatively high resolution and you can also extract multi, like many parameters from each cell and you can sort cells around 1,000 to 5,000 cells per second. Uh, sorry, you can analyze cells at that speed, but you cannot sort. So that's a major limitation of technology. And back in 2016, there were two papers, one in science, one in cell which on the one hand reported ghost cytometry, it's an image-free um, fluorescent activated cell sort. However, however, it can extract spatial information from raw data. So it doesn't provide the images. However, it's rel relatively fast in sorting and you can train neural networks in that machine in order to isolate cells with specific phenotypes of interest. On the other hand, there was um, NITA cell 2018. They, represent, they presented IX, image activated cell sorting, it's relatively low throughput, so it's at around 1,000 to 100 to 1,000 cells per second. And however, as you see already here on the image, it's, it's a very um, it's a complex technology, so it's it's nothing that you can immediately implement in your lab. And consequently, it also probably has like that was the major limitation why it didn't become probably available so far. And then it's finally um, us with BD who introduced ICS uh, beginning of the year which sorts at 15,000 cells per second. And also it will become uh, available as a commercial instrument by BD at some point. So what is ICS? So ICS, it's innovated very closely to traditional flow cytometry. Here, I'm depicting a schematic of how a flow cytometer works. So inject, you inject cells in, into a flow cell. These cells are accelerated and pass a laser interrogation point. And as the cell passes this point, we can detect light at different wavelengths using PMT detectors and analyze that signal in order to perform a sorting, sorting trigger as soon as the cell passes this nozzle point here where the cell is packaged into a droplet. So we can charge this droplet up on demand and either deflect it by like sorting it into a collection volume or into a waste. With image-enabled cell, cell sorting, uh, this is a bit, getting a bit more complex and the real novelty is more on the left side here. So it's a specialized optical module which uses fluorescent uh, imaging using radio frequency tech emission. It's a specialized imaging technology, which uh, is able to capture images very fast and blur-free. And this technology works approximately, so different to traditional microscopes by generating, generating a so-called laser comb. So what we generate in classical flow is a single laser spot uh, where the cell passes by. However, in ICS, we generate a laser a detection region which consists of around 104 laser smaller laser spots and each of these laser beams it's modulated at a different frequency and by not only reading out the intensity of the light that gets emitted from each cell but also the frequency of this light we can assign specific positions in the cuvette to a pixel in the later image so we generate by frequency one axis of the image and by simple time and velocity the second dimension of the image so we the, time, so the, the width of these images and all, uh, throughout the presentation that will, will be around 60 micrometer 
which covers around this, which is covered by around 104 pixels, resulting in a resolution of around one to two micrometers per pixel. We can use this image data not only to perform ultra fast imaging, but really the key of the technology is sorting. So we digitize those signals and they can perform real time digital processing and image analyses in order to trigger trigger the machine in order to sort cells according to parameters that can be calculated from these images. And I will come to this um, in a second. To give you an impression of how what the image data actually looks like that we are getting off from the machine, I'm showing here different cellular organelles uh, of different size and shape, just to give you an impression by comparing it with like organelles that you, that you know from your own research, for example. For example, we can image the cytoplasmic membrane, which is very clearly distinguishable, for example, from the cytoplasm. And uh, we can also look at smaller organelles such as mitochondria, nuclei or Golgi apparatus, or even when it's getting even smaller, you can also image P-bodies, Cajal bodies and centrosomes, for example. Of note, some of these organelles due to the relatively low resolution of the technology are easy to distinguish, such as cytoplasm to cyt uh, cytoplasmic membrane to cytoplasm or mitochondria. If it becomes smaller, for example, we can't see single mitochondria since mitochondria are below resolutions. Consequently, we wouldn't be able to differentiate, for example, a protein, depending on the cell type, a protein that's, for example, localized in this cell here in the cytoplasm compared to the mitochondria. So there are limitations due to the lower resolution, but there are also many of those phenotypes can be actually very accurately quantified using ICS. For those who are actively working on with flow cytometry, I want to show you how the machine efficiently combines traditional flow data and imaging data in this short video here. Here on the left side, you can see how we trad traditionally look at flow cytometric cell sorting or uh, flow data. So we can plot um, parameters that we calculate from each cell as histograms or dot plots. However, since we have ICS now, we can actually look at each cell. So like we can, for example, mouse hover over this um, um, dot plot here and really see what are the cells behind each data point. We can also look at this image wall here on the right side. This image wall would be actively, actively refreshed if the, if the sample would be running at the moment, which, is, which it is not. And consequently, we can really, we get a lot of additional confidence compared to traditional flow data. However, it's not only about additional confidence and looking at images, it's also about quantifying. And just to show you how we quanti can quantify data and how this looks in real life, I'm showing you here a protein called rel A. It's a cytoplasmic protein, which has been tagged with M neon green. And these same cells were countersaned with a nuclear dye called TREC5. And we now use the image derived parameter. So it's not a traditional flow parameter. It's nothing that traditional flow can do. It's an image parameter, which, ca which calculates the correlation pixel by pixel between the rel A protein and the TREC5. Under steady state conditions, the protein is cytoplasm, and consequently, we have low correlation. However, um, we can induce a, the so called NF kappa B pathway, of which REL A is a component. So, if we induce the NF kappa B pathway, REL A, which is a transcription factor, would travel from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, consequently, which should in lead to an increase in correlation between both uh, treatments. And that's, let's do that now. So, as soon as we add TNF alpha 2 cells, we can see the correlation strongly increasing. So this is something, again, nothing that can be quantified with traditional flow. There's no change in, no major change in gene in protein expression of rel A during that short treatment. And we can also nicely see the effect here in the images as the signal almost completely disappeared from the cytoplasm. We can also look at different types of phenotypes. I'm just depicting some examples here to give you an impression of what the machine can do. So each, part or like each panel here, A, B, C, D, it's one phenotype uh, which has been quantified with one image parameter. So here, for example, we're looking at the size parameter. So um, in a naturally grown HeLa cell population, for example, we have uh, such a distribution of um, the size signal. So we are looking at um, KS67, it's a nuclear marker which has been tagged with GFP. So most of the cells under steady state conditions, they have a single nuclear loss, however, we can also find by looking at the edges of this um, image parameter, identify cells with multiple or enlarged nuclear life, for example. We can also use another parameter to distinguish single nucleated cells from multinucleated cells. We can also look at the cell shape or cell morphology. We can distinguish round cells from more elongated cells. 
but we can not only look at natural variability within a population, we can also, for example, add a treatment to cells. So here we're adding prefilidin A to cells. So those are cells that have been stained or that have been where we visualize the Golgi apparatus with uh, uh, gal nact 2 used to GFP. Under steady state condition, the Golgi apparatus is located in a single spot within a cell. However, as soon as we add prefilidin A, it's an inhibitor of ER Golgi transport, the Golgi apparatus get dis gets dispersed throughout the side of lesson, which we can not only see on images, we can also use a parameter called max intensity here in this example to quantify this difference. So we can isolate cells which, um, are, which show an untreated or prefilidin A treated phenotype. And importantly, that's nothing that we can capture efficiently with traditional flow, since if we measure GFP intensity within those cells, there's largely no change. Again, uh, it's around, I think, like a 60-minute treatment plus minus. Now, we, for demonstrating sorting with ICS, we used um, another well, very well-known phenotype, um, like uh, cellular process called mitosis. So using traditional flaw cytometry, we can, we can very efficiently separate cells within G1, S phase, or G2M phase. However, traditional flow, it's really blind when it comes to specific types within mitosis, since those are processes that don't come along with a lot of gene expression or protein expression changes, but it's more spatial changes um, that, um, that, that are well, very well known for different mitotic stages. So here we are, we are looking at ICS data from different mitotic stages of HeLa cells that have been um, that express h 2 b fused to m neon green to visualize chromatin. And by eye, we can very clearly distinguish between interphase cells, prometaphase cells where chromatin condenses, metaphase cells where sister chromatins arrange in a metaphase plate. And we can also look at anaphase, for example, where sister chromatids are separating to the cell poles. And then finally in telophase, where the separations is, separation is going on and the cell bodies here in this bright field image are starting to um, Form, form this invagination as an indicator of later daughter cells. What we did is to, so in order to see whether ICS can capture or can isolate those different mitotic stages, what we did is to isolate or to uh, classify from each class around uh, 800 cells. And then we performed dimensionality reduction to see if there's any inform information in the data set combining both the traditional flow and also imaging uh, parameters in order to distinguish those phases. And indeed, if we go from interface to confeta phase and so on, we can say that we can see in this dimensionality reduction that there's, there's, there's information in the data set that ICS delivers that allows us to distinguish those different phases. And more, most interestingly, those phases also arrange in the UMAP in a chronological correct order, which is a good indicator that this is, um, which, which makes sense, it's a dynamic process. What we did next is to isolate cells from different mitotic stages. So we isolated cells from all five stages that we also, sorry, all five stages that we um, identified. And we isolated around 2,000 cells directly in the microscopy place and then performed high resolution confocal microscopy to, to, to quantify whether we actually um, sort the correct cells and how pure the, the fractions actually are. So here on the left side, you can see um, confocal microscopy images from the from four different phases that we isolated. And on the right side, you can see classifications from microscopy compared to the actual sorting gate that we use for isolating those cells. And what's obvious is that we can isolate highly pure fractions of most mitotic phases, partially over 90%. There's only some confusion between prometaphase and metaphase, for example, however, if you think about a metaphase, um, if you turn it by 90 degree, it suddenly would look like a prometaphase. And indeed, ICS, it's not a confocal microscope where we can do set stacking and anal analysis of set stacks, for example. However, it's, it's more like a wide field microscope. And also look at the, looking at this single stack of a confocal microscope, even using traditional microscopy, if we don't do the set stack and manually classify those images, we often cannot distinguish between cells which could be prometaphase or metaphase, although actually the sample is highly pure. So now going to high throughput function genomic screening and obvious next step would be to combine crystal perturbations with image enabled cell sorting in order to perform very fast function genomic screens with imaging readouts. 
And what has been done in the past or, uh, or recently has been published uh, from, uh, for example, from Paul Blaney's lab and, other, uh, and another method from other groups are two different methods how to efficiently combine pool genetic screens to, um, to microscopy images, microscopy imaging, uh, which has not been possible um, previ previously. So on the one hand, uh, from Paul Blaney's lab, they introduced microscopy combined with in situ guide and barcode sequencing. So it's a fantastic and uh, spectacular method which where we can do high res capture high resolution images from cells as they are growing in, in a dish. And then subsequently we can fix those cells and perform in situ barcode sequencing of guide RNA barcodes and in order to genotype those cells and combine CRISPR, for the CRISPR readout, like guide RNA identities with uh, phenotypic readouts. Another method, it uses a trick it overexpresses a photoactivatable protein in your cell type of interest or photo switchable protein. And by combining photo activation or switching with imaging readout, you can tag specific cells of interest in order to photo switch or activate them. And then those cells of interest, which you have tagged on the microscope, they can then be subsequently isolated with fluorescent activated cell sorting just by looking at signal intensities. So both methods, they are very efficient when it comes to coupling guide RNA with microscopic phenotype. However, they are relatively slow and also need highly customized technological setups. And that's where we thought ICS could be an interesting technology. And before we go into pool genetic screening, we first wanted to see if we can capture effects of CRISPR perturbations if we look at, um, if we um, uh, use ICS. And here we're looking again as at the already mentioned nf kappa b pathway, which senses TNF, like, um, TNF-alpha binding to a surface receptor. This activates an intracellular signaling cascade, which then results in the protein REL-A being translocated from the, from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And if we knock out three different core nf kappa b pathway components, components here on the right, each row of this image shows a different um, target gene. So here we have non-targeting controls and the three different target targeting genes here. And each column is one of three guidance that we used. And the important part is the difference between the orange and the blue curves. So the orange curve is the situation without TNF alpha induction. And the blue curve is the situation with TNF alpha induction. So again, we are looking at correlation between, rel, uh, with, between track five and rel A. And it's very clear that if we use non tidying guides, the, to, to the induced and non-induced conditions are well separated. However, as soon as we knock out specific proteins of the nf B pathway, the cells partially or completely lose their ability to respond to TNF-alpha since they cannot, since RLA doesn't efficiently translocate on the nucleus anymore. For sure, some guide RNAs, we also found that they have no effects, but these have not been pre-validated. So we to would totally expect that there might be also be non-active guide RNAs. So looking into genomic screening, again, we have the TNF-alpha pathway here and the, the type of read that we're be, that be using to, as a proxy for nf baby pathway activity, which is correlation between RLA and track 5 And what we did next is to not only knock out each gene of the nf baby pathway, but we relatively immediately went into genome-wide screening uh, involving experiments of up to 120,000 guide RNAs. So we covered each gene with six guide RNAs and 100x coverage after sorting, resulting in uh, around 12 million sorted cells per fraction. And to look in a bit more de in detail into the experimental outline, so this it's relatively similar to traditional facts-based screens with intensity readouts, for example. So we can synthesize guides, we clone those into lentiviral libraries, then we transduce those libraries into cells that already express Cas9 protein. Here in this case, it's inducible protein, and the cell lines already express rel A fused to MD on green. After selection of guide RNAs and Cas9 induction, we let the cells recover. And then we induce all of the cells with TNF alpha. And then we isolate two different like three different fractions. So one an impulse sample for sure, but also an upper fraction, which contains highly correlating cells or lowly correlating cells. So in this fraction, lowly correlating, for example, we, we would enrich positive regulators of the pathway, while negative regulators would be um, enriched in the upper fraction. Before going in genome wide, we first did a test to see how, how high we actually have to cover the entire library. So we, we did a relative, relatively small scale screen of around 1,200 genes, like core NFKB regulators and some associated genes. 
and then generated a high coverage 250x coverage ground ground truth data set in perform from pit calling and identif identified most of the core NFWP pathway components. But we didn't want to use the data set to look into uh, novel hits. However, what we wanted to do is to, to downsample the data set to see what's the size of experiment we have to do in order to have a powerful readout, but at least, uh, but ideally to, to sort as few cells as necessary. So we downsampled on one hand, the number of cryonase per gene, and also we performed sorts with different coverage of the entire library from 10x around to um, 250x. And then we used AOPRC analyses to see how well do we recover these hits from the ground truth high coverage data set. And we found that around three guidelines per gene and 100 cells per guideline would be sufficient to um, capture most of the effects that we found in the high coverage data set. And here's the result from the genome wide screen. Um, importantly, the Genome wide screen has been performed in two days, which is really fast compared to traditional microscopy based screens, which can take weeks or even months to complete. And what we found is um, positive and neg negative regulators, many known ones, but even for a well studied pathway like NFKBB, uh, we also find novel regulators. Let's first have a look at the known ones. So here I'm depicting the core NFKBB pathway, all genes that we found significant in blue, while other genes that we didn't find significant in, in gray. However, exactly those three genes that they didn't fi find were actually uh, identified previously actually in Bob Blaney's lab, not to be essential for pathway activity, at least in the cell type that we have used for this assay here. We also wanted to look if we can find novel genes. So we did GO term based network analyses to um, see which pathways uh, our hits were enriched. So we found, as expected, a very well connected cluster centered around chrome immune signaling. So these are the NFCOPY path, core pathway components and known regulators thereof. But to our surprise, we also found a second relatively well connected cluster around centered around chromatin modification. And when looking what those hits actually are, they mostly lo localize or are mostly part of two specific nuclear chromatin remodeling complexes, SAG and ENO-80 complexes. And we uh, would be curious to find out how those complexes actually influence the NFKB pathway. We also per performed microscopic validation, not only to validate the hits that from our screen, but also to understand better how powerful ICS is com in comparison with traditional microscopy. So we validated around 20 hits that have not been characterized as part of the NFKB pathway so far, so, so, such as components of the Saga complex. And then we performed correlation analyses from IC, from array ICS data, microscopy data, and performed those um, values to, to um, or those phenotypes to the phenotypes that detect in the pool genetic screen and identified actually very well or high, high concordance between the different readouts indicating at least for NFKB, ICS can be as powerful as traditional microscopy. So what's up next? And um, we are very curious to find out for sure also to discuss with you later what you find interesting, what you would use the technology for. Last but not least, um, before quickly going into TAPSEQ, um, we also interested in other omics readers. So we want to combine CRISPR perturbations with um, ICS readouts, but also since we can readily isolate those cells, to perform also, also other orthogonal downstream readouts such as transatomics and for, for example, to combine um, methods such as crop seek and site seek and ICS uh, to capture the entire wave from perturbation to transatomic mechanism and phenotypic readout. And for this, we have developed in the past um, a method called targeted perturbation sequencing. It's very similar to perturbsic, I will show you in a second, and it also combines CRISPR Cas9 perturbations with single cell RNA sequencing readouts. And how this method works, um, this is probably uh, looks very familiar to you since I've shown it previously. We again, we synthesize guide RNAs, uh, we clone those into lentral vectors, and then we apply those libraries to cells. And instead of doing ICS, we can actually do single cell RNA sequencing. So that has been published previously, like perturbseq, crispseq, cropseq, similar principles on the, on the different names and to perform whole transitome readouts from these, from these cells that have been perturbed. And by not only reading on the transitome, but also the guide RNA identity, we can couple both and perform like thousands of knockout or knockdown or CRISP activation or whatever else experiments literally in a single pipetting step. 
However, thinking about costs, for example, and also uh, the complexity of the essays, we thought about how could we actually make it more simple and also more economic. And we are think we're thinking of, since we in many essays we are not interested in the entire transitome, but also only specific genes, we would do a multiplex PCR to amplify only specific genes of interest, and that's TAPSIC now. And by amplifying also the guiding perturbation, we can assign specific guiding perturbations to targeted transitome readouts. And indeed, this assay, it, it focuses on up to 1,000 genes per assay. It lowers sequencing requirements about up to 50-fold. And most importantly, it also increases the sensitivity towards slowly expressed genes, such as transcription factors, for example, which are very hard to cover at sufficient read depth with whole transitome readouts. And also when it comes to weak expression changes, like thinking about enhancer regulation, which can often be on, have only like partial effects or low uh, small effects on their target gene expression. And that's exa exactly where uh, we want to put um, TAPSIC to a test. So we want to compare, or we want to find, can we generate not generate structure-based enhancer target gene maps, such as uh, those map maps that were generated with high C, but go into really function-based maps where we perturb an enhancer or perturb hundreds of enhancers and read out potential target genes in a highly parallelized fashion using TAPSeq. What we did is to um, select two genomic regions on two different chromosomes, chromosome 8 and 11, covering around 2.5% of our genome. And we, using ENCO data, we predicted all putatively active enhancers within the same genomic regions and also the active, uh, like the expressed target genes. So we were using CRISPR inactivation to activate, inactivate those enhancers. And consequently, it only made sense to read out expressed target genes. In total, we perturbed around 1,700 enhancers and read out around 150 target genes in a, an experiment involving around 230,000 cells covering 7,000 guide RNAs. And I don't want to go into detail, but what we uh, generated is such detailed function-based enhanced target gene maps. So here in yellow, you can see genes that are associated with a different number of um, enhancers, and the other way around, enhancers which are associated with different numbers of genes. And we can even zoom into different specific regions, such as this hemoglobin region. So we are looking at KFX2 cells. So hemoglobin genes are highly expressed, and we have identified several enhancers that were actually regulating this uh, gene HbA1, which has been, and many of those have been known previously. And in summary, we found that most genes were regulated by one and two, one or two enhancers. Around 30% of the genes that we identified to be regulated by enhancers were, were, sorry, about the 30% of the genes that we probed were regulated by at least one enhancer. Importantly, this is a difference to, to classical perturbseq assays, where um, others found around only 5% of the genes to be regulated by enhancer. And also, um, we found that only a small proportion of the enhancers that we actually perturbed had a associated target gene, which is in line with our understanding that enhancers are active in a highly cell type specific manner. So we used that data um, to also look at the enhancer target gene connections in a more holistic fashion in order to stand or to understand features that are specific for highly active enhancer target gene connections. So for example, we found that about 90% of the enhancers actually close to the transcription start, start side of their um, target gene. We also found an elevated high C interaction frequency um, within those active enhancer target gene interactions and also elevated several elevated chromatin marks. And we use that information then to also predict uh, or to generate machine learning models uh, to predict enhanced target gene pairs genome wide. And with this, I just want to wrap up quickly. I've presented you image enabled cell sorting, which combines fluorescent activated cell sorting with multicolor fluorescent imaging. This isolates microscopic phenotypes at very high speed, so at the same speed as we can do it with traditional flow cytomeric cell sorting, up to 15,000 cells per second. So it's, there's literally no limitation, even though we add, it, add imaging on top. We can detect phenotypes of natural spatial variability. We can also quantify drug effects or isolate cells, for example, which are resistant to drug effects. We can perform CRISPR participation and quantify those effects. And we can also isolate all major mitotic stages within minutes. We 
I've shown you how image enabled cell sorting can be used to perform genome scale kinetic screens um, in a very short time. And we found novel regulators or potential novel regulators of even very well studied pathways, such as the NFKPP pathway. And last but not least, I've touched quickly TAPSeq, which combines CRISPR perturbations with targeted signals at RNA seq readouts which allows us to characterize thousands of perturbations per experiment. And I've shown you an example where we generate um, genome scale enhancer target gene map maps. And we also for sure are interested in the future to apply those to, for example, disease associated genetic variants, which are often located within enhancer regions. And with, with this, I'm at the end of the talk. I want to thank um, everyone involved from the Steinmetz lab for sure, also our partners uh, within Amble and outside Amble. And I want to, again, note the great people at BD Biosciences um, with whom we collaborate on image enabled cell sorting. And with this, I'm happy to take any of your questions. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. That was a very, very impressive talk. There's already a few questions coming in, but if anybody else listening has questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A now. So there's a first question from Jenya Ivakine, who's asking about uh, a practical question of how difficult might this be to set it up in the lab? Um, is it likely to be a technology that will be used in core facilities rather than by individual labs? Mm -hmm. So it, it will be, so the operation of IC is, it will be extremely similar to traditional flow cytometry. So everybody who can do to traditional flow uh, will also be able to handle image enabled cell sorting. It's not the other way around. So it will be more tricky for microscopy people to get trained on because they would have to be trained on flow cytometry. And consequently, having this machine in a flow cytometry setup would be highly, um, um, I personally find the, the most um, uh, clever way to do it. Um, but it's Everybody, so so it, it's it's not more different, more, more difficult compared to, to to traditional flow cytometry, and consequently, um, every scientist, I, I guess, would, could be trained on that technology. Cool. And then <clears throat> there was a question asking um, if you'd be able to give a bit more detail on the readout you were using for deep mutational scanning. Was it, for example, localization? And maybe if you could talk a bit more about um, the different phenotypic re phenotypic readouts um you've applied or envision applying using this mm -hmm. so um with deep mutational scanning we we perform we use similar readouts as we use for nf b screen for example so here we, we are looking at nuclear cytoplasmic um, distributions and on top we also looked at granularity of the signal within the cytoplasm for example so we can look look at same different phenotype types at once and also since we can isolate those we can um, assign different phenotypes to the same um, to the, to the same perturbation in the same experiment. For example, we can uh, read out the intensity. We can sort cells with high or low intensity of the of the genes, like the traditional flex space readout. But we can also in parallel isolate cells uh, where we um, isolate cells based on a spatial phenotype, for example, in order to see like how highly is this mutant expressed? So what's the effect on gene expression? What's the effect of localization? And if we combine this with function readouts, what's, what's the effect of protein function, for example? Or if you look at protein interaction, what's the effect of the perturbation on interacting with a partner? Right. Um, and then there's a question from Reed Brewer asking, how does phenotype complexity impact throughput? Have you found imaging analysis to be a bottleneck to your throughput? Mm. So, so, so that we experience in a bottleneck, but it's not on the sorting side or operating the machine or performing experiments with it. It's more on the side when it comes to what's the most clever way to isolate your phenotype of interest. So it's an, so, the data on the machine is high dimensional. It's not like traditional flow where we look at area parameters like, like intensities. Often, since we have those multi additional parameters coming from the imaging data, it's not trivial for the human eye to assign a specific parameter to a phenotype. So that's, for example, why we used a combination of manual um, classification of cells 
and automated prediction of the most differentiating parameters for the mitosis data set, because here we could get even better than the human eye in isolating those phenotypes. Also, so some phenotypes are relatively subtle, and sometimes the machine is much better than the human eye in quantifying things. So it, it makes a lot of sense to think about, to, to, to use computation predictions like simple um, decision tree models, for example, to predict the most differentiating parameters and use those for sorting. Okay. And I think that that might be it for the Q&A. Thank you again for taking the time and the really great talk, Daniel. Um, I hope everyone's able to join us for our next session, which is on November 1st, where Tyler Starr will be giving a talk about the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 and related bat coronaviruses. I uh, just want to take a second again. Thank you, Daniel. The talk was really great. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in.